presenting the 47th annual Illinois High School Basketball Tournament. Hello everyone, this is Myron Walden with the highlights of the 1954 Sweet 16 from the George Huff Gymnasium on the University of Illinois campus in Champaign-Urbana. Dubbed the March Madness, the tournament is one of the most colorful of all sporting events. And plenty of radio and TV stations are on hand to cover as Ed Makowski, captain-elect of the 1955 Illinois basketball team, received the Ralph Woods Memorial Trophy. Lending beauty to the tournament was Jenny Riggs of Edwardsville, crowned queen of the Sweet 16. With Mount Vernon in the white jerseys and Danville clad in the dark, the opening tip-off goes to Albert Avant of Mount Vernon. Avant brings it up court. He's well covered, no chance for a shot. Avant passes to Thompson. His shot from the side is no good. Jim Ryder rebounds for Danville, and the boys attempt to set up a scoring pattern as the Mount Vernon bench studies the action. Number 30, Frank Estes with the ball for Danville. Passes into the key to Jerome Jones. Don Richard steals the ball away. Passes to Avant, who scurries up court for Mount Vernon. Avant hits with a long push shot from 20 feet out, and Mount Vernon goes into a lead. Mount Vernon again with the ball. Larry Whitlock passes in to Goff Thompson, who shows he can hit two by banging one in from the corner. Billy McMains of Danville with the ball, passes to Frank Estes, who dribbles down the side. Estes flings it back out to McMains as Danville looks for an opening in the Mount Vernon defense. It pays off as Estes puts two points in the scoreboard for Danville High School. Number 44, Albert Avant, one of the tournament's top players, is deadly from 20 feet away, and Mount Vernon leads 6-2. to two. Danville attempts to reduce the deficit as Jim Reiter, number 44, scores from the free throw line. Mount Vernon again in possession, Avant to Don Richards. And Richards, number 40, drives into the keyhole. He tries a jump shot, it's no good. A tip in by Larry Whitlock is no good, another no good, and Bill Hanna rebounds for Danville, but he smacks into Avant and Hanna's call for charging. Avant adds to his rapidly mounting tally. Danville's Bill McMains passes to Frank Estes. And this youngster shows that Avant isn't the only one who can score from 20 feet out. Estes again in possession. He dribbles down the side, passes to McMains. The ball goes underneath to Jim Ryder. Watch this boy drive in for the score. And the game is tied at 33 all. We pick up the action now in the second half with Danville clinging to a narrow 35 to 34 lead. Jerry Clark of Mount Vernon steals the ball from Frank Estes and drives the length of the court for the layup. A defender pushes the ball back to the hoop, but the score counts. Bill McMains is fouled and gets a free one for Danville. It's good. Don Richards passes in for Mount Vernon to Kim Driggers. Over to Avant and Bill McMains fouls Avant. Avant makes the first and comes right back to drop in the second free throw with a minute and 20 seconds to play. With Mount Vernon leading 56 to 51, the Danville captain, Frank Estes, hits one from the corner. Driggers flips the ball to Don Richards who passes down to Goff Thompson in the right-hand corner, and he bangs in a field goal to put Mount Vernon in front, 58-53. This fine Mount Vernon team is not to be denied as the powerful Rams go on to defeat a stubborn and fighting team from Danville by a 61-54 score. With a capacity crowd of rabid basketball fans in attendance, the second game featured East Rockford versus Moline. These lovely lasses competed in the Queen contest. The East Rockford E-Rabs are coached by Jim Laud, while the Moline Maroons are tutored by Jack Foley. The spirit was high for this game as the cheerleaders from the two schools put on a great pregame show. There's the tip-off. Roger Davidson captures the ball for East Rockford. He passes to Ronnie Johnson, who brings it over in the side to Paul Larson. A bounce pass goes down to Johnson, who bounces it right back over to Bill Laud, who drives for the basket. No good, the ball is knocked out of bounds. East Rockford, however, retains possession. The ball is worked into Bill Laud, who scores with a nice short jump shot. It's Johnny Myers, number 22, with the ball for Moline. A bounce pass goes to Adrian Winters. Over on the side to Bob Gunter. And Gunter displays a fine jump shot as he scores for Moline High School. East Rockford's Bob Pellant drives in. The shot is no good, but he tips the bounding ball to teammate Ronnie Johnson, who drives in and lays it up for the score. It's Johnny Myers with the ball. A bounce pass goes to Bob Gunter, who dribbles to the right-hand corner. Now back out to Myers. Now to Winters. To Dake Daybold, who scores in a jump shot.
Now watch this beautiful jump shot from the free throw line by Ronnie Johnson. Swish! And East Rockford is back in front by a point. Day ball of Moline up the sidelines. Roger Davidson takes the ball away for East Rockford. Now the ball is knocked away and it's picked up by Whitey Verstraight of Moline. He passes to number 13, Dayball, who tries a hook shot that's no good, but Verstraight tips it in. Here's a good close-up shot of the Moline coaches. East Rockford inbounds from the far side. The ball goes to Ronnie Johnson in the key. His shot, no good. Whitey Verstraight rebounds for Moline. He passes to Dick Dayball, who brings the ball up court. Dayball works it over to Gunter. Now back over to Dayball, then to Gunter again as Moline tries to set up a scoring pattern as they whip that ball around, waiting for an opening in the East Rockford defense. And with a healthy lead late in the game, Moline passes around, waiting for that sure shot as the East Rockford lads press in, trying to get possession of the ball. But it's all Moline in this game as Adrian Winner scores, and Moline hangs up a 70-53 victory over East Rockford. The Wednesday night session opened with Thornton of Harvey meeting Cumberland, a consolidated unit school, making its first state tournament appearance. Both teams go through the pregame warm-ups while another jam-packed crowd awaits the continuation of state tournament action. Thornton in white, Cumberland in the dark jerseys. The ball is battled over to Thornton captain Al Lowry who drives in but misses the layup. Howard McLean rebounds for Cumberland and drives down court. He takes a shot but it's no good. And Ed Creech comes up with the ball for Thornton. The Wildcats of coach Tommy Nesbitt whip that ball around. Vern Allison takes a shot, but it's no good. Cumberland's Howard Ewart drives down the sidelines with the ball. He passes underneath to Lloyd Eggers, who finally puts the first score on the board to give Cumberland a quick 2-0 first quarter lead. Both teams are tense and excited over the realization of playing in the tournament and have trouble hitting the basket. Here, Russ McKibben of Thornton evens up the score at 2-all with this beautifully set up score. Jim Strain takes the pass in for Cumberland and dribbles down the court. Over to Howard McLean, who hands off to Howard Ewert. Ewert's jump shot is no good, but Lloyd Eggers follows up for Cumberland to put the Pirates back in front, four to two. Thornton lost possession of the ball, and it goes to Cumberland once again. It's Strain with the ball. He gives to Eggers, and Eggers is red hot as he drops in another two-pointer. Jump ball, and it goes to Thornton's Rod Hanson, and he scores! The Thornton Wildcat, appropriately attired, displays his pleasure at the sudden turn of events, and ably assisted by the Thornton cheerleaders, whoops it up as Thornton races to a sizable lead. It's Thornton in possession. McKibben receives a high lob pass and displays fine form as he scores on this beautiful jump shot. After a cool start, Thornton has come on to pile up a safe lead over a game but outclassed Cumberland squad. And here in the final period, Fred Rettinger, a Thornton reserve, adds to the total to make the score Thornton 64, Cumberland 52. Russ McKibben in this game established himself as a truly fine basketball player as he poured in 32 points to lead Thornton. Most of McKibben's scoring was from the floor as the talented junior rammed in 14 field goals that's too shy of tying a tournament record. Thus, Thornton utilized its height and marksmanship as the Wildcats pile up an 83-59 victory over Cumberland. The closing game of Wednesday's opening day of tournament action featured the Springfield High School Senators against the Pinktyville Panthers as the entry Gene Purcell who drives hard to put Pinktyville out in front. In sharp contrast to the last game, this one is often flying early. Watch Don Morgan Taylor. He hits with a left-handed hook shot to put Pinktyville in front. Springfield on the offense, Davis passes off and a scoring play looms. Here it is, George Kenny, number 24. Hits from 20 feet out to close the gap as the scoreboard shows Pinky the leading Springfield, 40 to 35. Springfield tries valiantly to catch up, but there's not much time remaining. Here's a 15-footer by Springfield's George Kenny, who tallied 16 points. And now Pinkyville goes into a semi-stall as Springfield presses all over the court trying to get that ball. Pinckneyville leads at this point with just seconds remaining, 41 to 37. And folks, you're watching the cream of the crop of Illinois high school basketball talent at its best as these kids battle it out in a sweet 16. Pinckneyville striving to retain possession and Springfield still is in a full court press. Keith Rader, a little over anxious, fouls Jim Lazenby. And that should sew it up. Lazenby misses the first free throw, however. He eyes the basket and makes the next. 
as Pinkyville goes on to defeat upset-minded Springfield, 43 to 37, with Jim Lassenby 17 points leading Coach Duster Thomas's Pinkyville Panthers into the quarterfinal round. It was still in the opening round as Thursday afternoon's action opened with two high-scoring teams, Quincy and Princeton, facing each other. Quincy co-captains Tom Payne and Gene Holler with the left talk things over with the officials, along with Princeton's captain, guard John Zerlean. The tip-off is controlled by Princeton wearing the light jerseys, and another of these great state tournament games is underway. Watch the boys give a fine demonstration of ball handling as they set up a scoring play. A shot by Dick Swan puts Princeton into a 2-0 lead. The action continues as Quincy takes over possession of the basketball. Gene Holler dribbling up court. He loses possession, but Alan Zingle is there to pick it up and keep it for the Blue Devils. He passes back over to Holler. There's a bounce pass to Rod Rogers, into Alan Zingle, and he swishes the Nets for two points. Lewis Flynn has the ball for Princeton. He comes down court. His shot from the corner is no good. Swan captures the rebound, and he drops it in for Princeton to give his team a 48-45 lead here in the second half. We're showing you the highlights of the 1954 Illinois State High School Basketball Tournament played in the University of Illinois' Huff Gym. And there are many basketball coaches in attendance eyeing the play of these squads. In this game, all eyes are on Quincy's scoring twosome of Tom Payne and Bud Holler and Princeton's high-scoring center, Joe Rucklick. The boys were never in better form as their shots all afternoon were deadly. When you stop to think that the 16 teams represented in this tournament have been chosen from more than 700 high schools in the state, you get an idea of the magnitude of this tourney and just what it means for these youngsters to compete. All high school basketball players dream of the day when they can compete in the Sweet 16, which truly is the World Series of High School Basketball at Illinois, with proud parents and teachers on hand to root them on. With not too much time remaining, Princeton leads in this game 48 to 45, but Holler drops in a rebound basket to pull Quincy up to with only one point, as the scoreboard tells the story. As the boys fight on down to the wire, we'd like to give credit where credit is due. Princeton held a one-point lead going to the fourth quarter, but Quincy put on a last-minute drive in that final period to outscore Princeton 13 to 8, giving them a hard-earned and narrow 64 to 60 verdict. The big guns in the Quincy attack were the aforementioned Tom Payne, six foot six inch center, who was high point man with 25, and right behind him was guard Bud Holler, who pumped through a total of 23 points as he sparked Quincy's rally. For Princeton, the high point man was that fine hook shot artist Joe Rucklick, who got 24 big points. The final on this one again, Quincy 64, Princeton 60. A real David and Goliath battle developed when Dusable played Bowen in the first round. Dusable, representing the city of Chicago with its four million inhabitants, tangled with district winner Bowen, a town with just 612 citizens. Dusable started out fast in this game as guard Paxton Lumpkin pumps in a jump shot from the free throw line. Bowen in the lighter jerseys on the offense now. John Henson dribbles into the key. His jump shot is no good. Dusable rebounds, and the speedy quintet from Chicago races for the basket. McMillan scores from the pivot, and Dusable takes a 4-0 advantage. Bob Bilderbeck of Bowen passes to Johnny Henson. He tries a long one. Henson rebounds his own shot, tries another one. It still is no good. Dusable comes down with the ball. And a timeout is called as the Dusable bench watches as the Chicago cheerleaders take over. It's back to action now. It's Henson of Bowen with the ball. He passes cross court to Roger McMahon. Then over to Bilderbeck. Watch this deception as Don Tosh finally puts Bowen into the scoring column. Later in the game, and with Dusable in possession of the ball, Cowson passes to Charlie Brown over to Sterling Webb, and he hits with a long one-hander to make the score. Dusable 83, Bowen 58. Now, watch this great dribbling exhibition by Dusable's captain, Paxton Lumpkin. Because of Lumpkin's all-around fine play, he was voted the tournament's most valuable player by sports writers and sports announcers covering the annual affair. His school, Dusable, will receive a trophy in honor of Lumpkin's selection to be presented by the Coca-Cola bottlers. Lumpkin will be given a medallion. Many of Dusable's baskets come on tip-ins, which goes toward piling up its lead over Bowen. But coach Jim Lewis's boys from Bowen played great ball for three quarters and gave Dusable all they wanted. And the score was tied six times before Dusable pulled away and went on to register an 87-63 victory over a determined Bowen team. 
The seventh game of the opening round, which opened Thursday night's activity, featured Litchfield against Barrington as both clubs made their initial appearance in the state tournament. It was Litchfield from the central part of the state versus Barrington from the Chicago suburban area as another full house viewed the proceedings at the George Huff Gymnasium. Litchfield wearing white uniform sets up the play. The climax comes when Litchfield's Ron Purcell scores. There's a long pass down court to guard Elmer Safely of Barrington. He scores with a layup shot. Now Litchfield takes over and Larry Roach thrills the crowd with a swiss shot from the corner. Barrington comes right back. Roy DeWitts goes into the corner and tries a one-hander. No good, but Babs tip in is good. Now the Barrington team works the ball around with practically everyone in the club handling the basketball as the Broncos play it close to the vest, waiting for the opportunity that will give them a good shot. Guard Elmer Safely is clear and he scores with a push shot to give Barrington a 43-30 lead. It's Litchfield with the ball, but the Purple Panthers are below par physically and Barrington goes on to chalk up a 57-38 decision. It was a sad night for Litchfield and the cheerleaders walked dejectedly off the floor. Next, Peoria Central takes on Edwardsville to close out action in first round play. Here's a good shot of Peoria cheerleaders as they lend moral support to their favorites. Edwardsville is attired in black jerseys, Peoria Central in white uniforms. During the highlights of this game, you'll see some of the finest shooting in high school basketball, such as this nifty two-pointer by Don Ole of Edwardsville. Edwardsville piled up a 17-8 lead in the first half as the Peoria Central Lions of the Big 12 Conference had trouble hitting the basket with regularity. Peoria took second in the state last year, and many people had picked Coach Dawson Hawkins' Peoria team for another high spot this year. Now it's Edwardsville's Don Dudasek with the ball. His shot is no good, but there's a foul on the play away from the ball. With a chance to increase its lead, Edwardsville six foot eight inch center Jim Heron pushes in a free throw to give the Tigers a 22 to 11 margin. It's in the fourth quarter now and Edwardsville enjoys a 10 point lead, but Peoria Central stays in the game. Here center Alan Swanson pushes in a fielder from the foul line. Only minutes left to play now, but Peoria Central keeps in the game, despite the fact that two Peoria stars, Alan Swanson and Hal Douglas, have fouled out. Edwardsville, sparked by the high-scoring duo of Don Ole and Bob Greger, continue to keep the pressure on as the Tigers padded their lead by cashing in on important shots from the free-throw line late in the last period. And at the end of the game, the score was Edwardsville 60, Peoria Central 54. With the first round completed, it's time for the quarterfinals. And the first Friday afternoon game pitted the Mount Vernon Rams, coached by Harold Hutchins, against the Moline Maroons, under the guidance of coach Jack Foley. As usual, Huff Gymnasium was jammed as the third day of the 1954 state basketball tournament got underway. Here's the jump at center court. Whitlock of Mount Vernon taps it to Goff Thompson. Back over to Richards. Richards passes to Thompson. Over to Fred Dykeman, who displays a fine fadeaway shot, which sends Mount Vernon off to a 2-0 lead. Number 40, Don Richards, the dependable Mount Vernon guard, gives to Albert Avant. Watch him score. Tremendous shooting. And it's 4-0, and Avant will get a free throw as he fouled in the act of shooting. The free throw's no good. Johnny Myers grabs the ball, and Moline goes on the attack. Moline has yet to score as number 13, Dick Dayball, drives under the basket, but loses control of the ball. Mount Vernon takes over as Don Richards brings the ball up the side. He drives into the keyhole. His jump shot is perfect, and Mount Vernon leads 6 to nothing in the first quarter. Moline has the ball as we pick up action in the second quarter with Mount Vernon on top, 27 to 20. Dayball scores for Moline and it's 27 to 22 as Mount Vernon coach Harold Hutchins surveys the situation. These boys are really battling. Richards of Mount Vernon loses the ball to Adrian Winters. Winters drives down the sidelines and scores to narrow the gap to 27 to 24. Mount Vernon still ahead. Avant on the drive, 
He's fouled, attempting to shoot. He'll get two free throws. He been at the foul line. He has 14 points. Now make it 15. He's got another free throw coming. This one also is good. Bob Gunter of Moline in possession in the fourth period with his team trailing 58 to 45. Here's a close jump shot by Whitey Verstraight that makes it 58 to 47. It's that man Avant at the free throw line again. The first is up and in. Avant again. The second shot right through. And Moline with just seconds remaining tries to score again. And Dale Swineberger does just that. But it was of little help as Mount Vernon defeated Moline 73 to 59. Now it's Thornton versus Pinckneyville in another quarterfinal game. Pinckneyville in the dark jerseys. It's Jim Lazenby, number 21, with the ball for Pinckneyville. Lazenby gives to Gene Purcell, and Gene bores in hard to get Pinckneyville out in front, two to nothing. Ed Creech of Thornton takes the inbounds pass, and coach Tommy Nesbitt's well-drilled team sets up the play. The pass goes to Russ McKibben. He misses the layup, but Rod Hansen is there to tip it in, to not the score at two all. Lazenby with the ball for Pinckneyville. Gives to Arlen Hill. He finds Don Morgan Taylor in the clear, and Don makes the shot to give Pinckneyville an early 4-3 lead. Her boyfriend must be in this game. In the second quarter, Pinckneyville in possession. Hill stops at the key, passes to Morgan Taylor, to Purcell, and his jump shot is good. Pinckneyville's in front, 32-23. Thornton comes right back as they pass the ball all over the court, awaiting for that sure shot that'll mean two points. Watch number 22, Vern Allison. Allison swishes it through from way out. How's that for shooting? Pinkneyville on the attack. Purcell drives to the corner. Passes back to Lazenby. Now back to Purcell. Purcell shot, no good. Marion rushing, grabs the rebound, and he scores. It's Pinkneyville 53, Thornton 39. This is an important quarterfinal game, and Thornton is a bit puzzled by the tight Pinkneyville defense. A deep shot from the corner by Allison is good, but Thornton still trails 55 to 41. Thornton tries desperately to close the gap by pressing all over the court, but the Panthers from Pinckneyville are good ball handlers and seldom get rattled. Watch them bring it down court and work with it till they get that shot that they want. Lazenby dribbling with the ball gives it to Purcell. Purcell to Morgan Taylor, now to Lazenby again. Over to Morgan Taylor, into Hill, he scores! And Pinkneyville moves into the semifinals with a 61 to 47 win over Thornton of Harvey. Producing the state basketball tournament is a big job. Two of the men most responsible are Albert Willis, executive secretary of the Illinois High School Association, and Fred L. Beaster of Glen Ellen, secretary treasurer of the organization, shown here relaxing a bit between tourney sessions. It's Quincy versus Dusabel of Chicago in the first night game of the Friday quarterfinals. Dusabel comes into the game with a record of 29 straight victories, and the Panthers have yet to taste defeat this season. Quincy, in the light jerseys, have one of the best individual performers in the tournament in All-State Center, Tom Payne. Here, the six-foot, six-inch Mr. Payne gives a demonstration of his tremendous reach as he taps in a basket. The DeSable team also knows where that bucket is located. Paxton Lumpkin passes to McKinley Cousin, who shows you how to score from 15 feet out. It's late in the second quarter now, and DeSable has an eight-point lead. Watch this beautiful shot coming up. Quincy's Tom Payne drives underneath. Passes to Bill Reinberg. Reinberg drives under and scores with a tremendous over-the-shoulder shot. Sensational shooting. DeSable comes right back and scores again. That's Shelly McMillan scoring. It's Quincy's ball, but some alert defensive work by Dusable gives the Panthers possession. A fast break basket is good, but traveling is called, and the basket doesn't count as the first half ends. Here, Paxton Lumpkin demonstrates his great ability as he scores on this difficult angle shot to give Dusable a 43 to 37 advantage. Once again, it's Dusabo with the ball. Spectacular shots were commonplace in this game as sweet Charlie Brown throws in a beauty. 
Quincy's Tom Payne comes right back with a neat over-the-shoulder shot of his own. But the damage had been done, and the Blue Devils couldn't catch the Panthers as Dusable trim Quincy 80-66 to, to qualify for semifinal play. The last game of the quarterfinals was Barrington versus Edwardsville, and these two teams treated the fans to some excellent shooting and the tournament's only overtime game. Barrington jumped off to a fast lead as center Dick Pop loops in a shot. Edwardsville inbounds with the ball. Bill Pendleton bringing it up court. Pendleton passes to Don Dudasek. His shot, no good. It's rebounded by Craig Oberst of Barrington. Now Elmer Savely brings it up court. Over to Babb. Now to Roy DeWitz, who scores with a long jump shot. That's good, and Barrington leads 4 to nothing. Edwardsville takes over. Pendleton up court. He passes to Bob Greger, who hits from the keyhole. These Edwardsville fans are really delighted. We're now in the second quarter, and Barrington is clinging to a 17-15 lead, but here's two points by Bob Greger to tie it up. Savely to Roy DeWitz, and he hits with a long jump shot. Tremendous shooting by these Illinois high school kids. A long Edwardsville pass goes down court to Bob Greger. He's almost tied up, but Greger commits a personal foul. Vance Stainer makes the free throw for Barrington. Barrington leads by one, and this girl approves. This game's going to go right down to the wire. Now watch this shot that sends the game into overtime. That was a sensational 25-foot one-hander, uncorked by Roy DeWitts of Barrington. How about that one for thrills? In the three-minute overtime period, Elmer Savely fouls Manny Jackson of Edwardsville. The tension is really at a peak in this game, but Jackson calmly makes the first shot. Now, Jackson adds the second to give Edwardsville a 57-53 lead. Savely gives to Jerry Babb. And he scores on a jump shot from the free throw line, and Barrington trails by two points. But Savely fouls Don Ohl. Edwardsville leads 57-55. Edwardsville puts the game on ice as Don Ohl sinks both free throws, and Barrington is eliminated in a thrilling overtime battle, 59-57. Four teams still remain from the field of 16 that started play Wednesday as we come up to the all-important semifinal games of Saturday afternoon. The opening contest rekindles an old rivalry as two of Southern Illinois' best, Mount Vernon and Pinckneyville, battle it out. Mount Vernon's Albert Avant, a six-foot guard, gave opposing teams trouble all through the tournament with his almost unstoppable fadeaway jump shot. Here's a good demonstration of what we mean as Avant scores on a nice shot. Phenomenal shooting. Now we've got action in the final period with Mount Vernon leading 43 to 29. Don Richards from 20 feet away, socks in the field goal to make it Mount Vernon 45, Pinckneyville 29. The blue-shirted Pinckneyville Panthers bring it up court. Guard Jim Lazenby lobs a pass to Arlen Hill. He feeds back over to Lazenby. Lazenby's shot rims the bucket and Fred Dykeman grabs the rebound for Mount Vernon. Now it's Pinkneyville with the ball. Lazenby dribbling with it, going all the way in. He jumps in a one-hander, it's good! And Pinkneyville trims Mount Vernon's lead. Moments ago, we told you about Avant's jump shot. Well, the eagle-eyed Mount Vernon guard can also drive when the occasion demands. Watch this honey of an underhanded scoop shot, despite the fact Avant is knocked off balance. Man alive, that's really something, and this crowd agrees. Pinkneyville brings the ball down. Dallas Hill drives in. His shot, no good. Kim Driggers rebounds for the Rams and speeds down court. The ball goes out of bounds and over to Pinckneyville. Mount Vernon jumped off to a lead early in this game and the Rams were never headed and they padded their total as the game progressed. The final score was Mount Vernon 70, Pinckneyville 44 and the Rams had fought their way into the finals by virtue of a decisive victory over favored Pinckneyville. Pom Pom Girls lending color to the tournament, the high-scoring and crowd-pleasing DeSable team takes the floor against Edwardsville in the afternoon's last semifinal game, with the winner slated to meet Mount Vernon for the title. The center jump is between Shelly McMillan and Jim Heron. The ball goes to DeSable. A shot by Carl Dennis is blocked. 
Bill Pendleton bats the ball back into play as Don Dudasek dribbles down court for Edwardsville. The Edwardsville co-captains, Don Old and Bob Greger, are the spark plugs of the Tigers' attack. And these two lads gain many plaudits from the sports writers and sports announcers covering this 47th annual Illinois State High School Basketball Tournament. Here's an example of accurate shooting as Bob Greger scores with a twisting jump shot. Dusabal on the attack now as Paxton Lumpkin brings it up. In the corner to McKinley Cousin. The shot is missed and Charlie Brown snags the rebound, then scores. In the second quarter, Paxton Lumpkin hits on his famous jump shot. Edwardsville trails by a 36-30 score. Dusabal presses, but the Tigers hold onto the ball. Bob Greger tries one from the side. No good. A tip in, no good. And McMillan rebounds for Dusabal. Charlie Brown passes to Lumpkin, and he drives in for two more points, which gives Dusabal a 48-42 halftime lead. Now it's midway in the third quarter, and McMillan leaps high into the air to sink the shot for Dusabal. Dusabal has a comfortable lead, but Edwardsville continues to battle away. Bob Greger passes to Heron, who makes an easy basket. Nice play by Greger. With Dusabal leading 87-70, the Panthers take over the ball as McKinley Cousin drives for the score. His shot is missed, but McMillan tips it in as Dusabal sets a tournament record for the highest single-game score for a winning team. The final score was Dusabal 89, Edwardsville 73 for a new two-team scoring record. In the consolation game, Pinkneyville tangles with Edwardsville for third place as the last session of the 1954 tournament gets underway. As we pick up the action, Pinkneyville in the white uniforms have the ball. Gene Purcell feeds in the side to Jim Lazenby and he sinks a 20-footer. Now here's a spectacular shot by Edwardsville Bob Greger coming up. Watch it closely now as Don O flips it underneath to Greger. He throws it over his head and scores. An amazing shot. The deliberate Panthers work the ball around. In the corner to Morgan Taylor. Back on the side to Arlen Hill and he sinks it. At the half the score was Pinkneyville 27, Edwardsville 21. In the third period, Morgan Taylor from the corner hits on a one-hander. Edwardsville attempts to close the gap. Gregor hits from the side to pull the Tigers to within six points of Pinckneyville. Marion rushing with the ball. He's fouled by Dick Sosick. Rushing has two shots, the first good. Rushing also converts on the second. Edwardsville has the ball. And Coach Joe Luco empties the bench as the reserves play out the remaining minutes of the game. Al Patton has it. Maneuvers it in to Manny Jackson, who fakes, shoots, and misses. Purcell takes the rebound for Pinkneyville. And the Panthers stay in control of the game the rest of the way for the third place victory. The final score, Pinkneyville 54, Edwardsville 42. As another of Coach Duster Thomas's Pinkneyville basketball teams concludes the season ranked as one of the state's best. Congratulations, too, are in order for the Edwardsville Tigers. This was only Edwardsville's second visit to the state tournament in the school's history, and the Tigers' fourth place finish is a tribute to its fine team and school spirit. Now, this is the game the whole state of Illinois has been waiting for, the championship game for the coveted 1954 prep basketball crown. It's Dusable, led by its captain and outstanding floor leader, Paxton Lumpkin, against the powerful Mount Vernon Rams. This is what every high school basketball player dreams of, playing for the championship, symbolic of basketball supremacy in the state of Illinois. Mount Vernon, clad in the white uniforms, controls the opening tip-off, but the Rams let the ball go out of bounds, and it goes over to Dusabal. Dusabal cashes in on this opportunity as the Chicago team breaks the ice and sets up a scoring pattern to jump off to a quick lead. The ball goes around the perimeter into the corner to Shelly McMillan, who pivots nicely for the score. One of Dusabal's favorite weapons is the full court press, designed to harass the opposition. The ball goes to Mount Vernon's Fred Dykeman, and he's fouled at midcourt. Dykeman at the free throw line with the one and one. The first, no good. Dykeman's second attempt, right through. Dusabal's captain, Paxton Lumpkin, brings it up court. Over to Charlie Brown, who scores with a beautiful 20-foot jump shot. 
It's Lumpkin again with the ball. This time, Shelly McMillan simply outleaps the opposition as he scores easily. Now, Mount Vernon's Albert Avant puts on a great show of shooting skill as he loops one in from the corner to trim DeSable's lead to six to five. It's DeSable on the move again. McKinley Cousin's shot is wide. Larry Whitlock rebounds for Mount Vernon. Over to Avant. And Albert Avant, a six-foot guard for Mount Vernon, escapes Dusabel's pressing defense. Avant passes to Whitlock. His shot, no good. Avant rebounds, drives under, and scores again to give Mount Vernon a 7-6 to six advantage. Avant was fouled while making the basket and has a chance to add a free throw. It's no good. McMillan rebounds for Dusabel. It goes to Paxton Lumpkin. His shot is good. And midway in the second period, the score is not at a 29 all. It's Lumpkin again with the ball. He shoots, but he misses this time, and the ball goes out of bounds. Now, watch this neat out-of-bounds play by Dusabel. Charlie Brown from the corner, hits, and he puts Dusabel ahead, 31 to 29. Mount Vernon with the ball, and it's Don Richards down the side. Richards shot, no good, and in the scramble, the ball goes out of bounds. It's awarded to Mount Vernon. Avant tries a one-handed shot from the side. Lumpkin rebounds and races down court. Lumpkin dribbles into the corner. And here's a Swiss shot for Paxton Lumpkin of Dusabo. In order to get into this championship game, Mount Vernon had to defeat Danville, Moline, and Pinckneyville, while Dusabo down Bowen, Quincy, and Edwardsville. This championship game has been a close one all the way. Now watch for this play. Here's an easy basket by Charlie Brown of Dusable to give the Chicago School a 35 to 29 lead. But the Mount Vernon Rams come roaring right back as Don Richards dribbles down and hits with this nifty jump shot to make it 35 to 31. It's Dusable's ball and the Panthers lead by four points. McMillan's hook just barely misses. It's Mount Vernon with the ball now. Whitlock across court to Richards. The ball is stolen by Lumpkin, but Lumpkin fouled Richards. Don Richards with an underhanded free throw, makes it. With the score, Dusabel 35, Mount Vernon 32. The first half nears completion. Charlie Brown's long jump shot from the side is wide. The ball went out of bounds. Now it's Mount Vernon, a cool, calculating basketball team with an evenly balanced scoring attack on the offense as the Rams bring the ball up court. This is the big championship game. Mount Vernon against Dusabel, and it's been a real thriller all the way. This has been another great tournament, as every boy from all 16 teams representing every section of this great state of Illinois brought to the 1954 tournament not only a keen spirit of competition, but also an admirable quality of sportsmanship. And these traits have been in evidence in this championship game, as Mount Vernon and Dusable trade basket for basket. Mount Vernon trying to get a shot away. Here's Avant, and he hits! Avant was fouled, and the score is Dusable 35, Mount Vernon 34. He can tie it up by making this free throw. It's good! And the ball game is tied 35 all as the Mount Vernon fans leap with joy. Now we pick up action in the fourth quarter with Mount Vernon leading Dusable 67-63. McKinley Cousin narrows that lead as he races in for a nice drive-in shot. Mount Vernon is out to widen the gap as the Rams bring it slowly up court. Richards gives to Avant. Charlie Brown steals the ball for Dusabo, flips it to Lumpkin. Lumpkin drives in, his shot, no good, but a tip in by McMillan is good. The basket doesn't count, Lumpkin was fouled. His free throw, the first one was good. Lumpkin again from that foul line looks up. He cans the second one to tie the game at 67-67. This is the 12th time the game has been tied. The tension mounts of this championship game. Don Richards drives to the free throw circle. He makes it good, and Mount Vernon has a 72-70 lead with 11 seconds to play. Richards was fouled. His first free throw was good to make it 73-70. Again, Richards, a calm, cool competitor. Throws it up. It's good. And the Rams have a 74-70 margin over Dusabo. With Lumpkin out of the game on five fouls, his replacement, Eugene Howard, throws the ball out of bounds. 
Mount Vernon sensing an impending triumph. The pass goes to Thompson, who collides with Charlie Brown, and a foul is called on Brown with just one second of playing time remaining, and the score, 74-70 in favor of Mount Vernon. Thompson had two free throws coming, and he made both of them as Mount Vernon won the 1954 Illinois High School Basketball Championship with a 76-70 win over a fine, disabled team. Mount Vernon thus became the first school in the history of the tournament to win four championships. The Rams won the title in 1920, 1949, 1950, and here in 1954. Now for the awarding of trophies. Coach Jim Brown takes the second place award for DuSable. And it's all hail the 1954 champions, the Mount Vernon Rams. <laughs> 